Hello there, ladies and gentlemen. Welcome to another exciting edition of HL Chemistry Flipped Classroom. This is Mr. Lowe's. Today we're going to talk about nucleophilic substitution reactions. The thing I'm going through now goes along with a note sheet, which should have been issued to you. So just uh, read this, follow along in the blanks. Uh, there's some blanks to record reactions and stuff like that. Make sure that you do that. All right. Uh, you have our IB topics down there. These are This is an HL uh, only topic, 20.1, A through D. Um, that is an I and J. So as we've had on this note sheet, some essential questions. You know, what is nucleophilic substitution in the first place? Obviously something important to consider. And what factors influence the mechanism by which, by which substitution reactions occur? So, I mean, these aren't the only things we're going to talk about, but these are the two big factors. And we're going to look at some specific mechanisms and specific situations in which reactions occur in an entirely different way depending on um, the conditions and the actual starting things. So let's jump into this and take a look. So we've talked about substitution reactions. It's basically a swapping of functional groups. We've talked about um, alkanes, which can undergo free radical substitution. This is a different type of situation. We're going to focus on uh, halogen alkanes for the most part. And one of the things that makes them susceptible to substitution reactions is their high electronegativity. Um, they have a bond here, like for example, in the uh, fluoroalkane here, we've got the carbon-fluorine bond, very polar bond, and we've got the partially positive carbon and the partially negative um, fluorine there. And so the partially positive charge is going to be something that is going to attract a nucleophile. Because remember, nucleophiles, they love nuclei, they love positiveness, so um, some sort of negatively charged thing or something with a partially negative charge can potentially attack that carbon. Um, so notice that there's a couple of things, like let's say we got a hydroxide ion here. Um, when we think about organic reactions, we need to think about what's going on three-dimensionally. And the, the fact is that this hydroxide is attracted to this partially positive carbon, but is repelled by this negative fluorine here. So it does have to attack, as we say, come into contact with the carbon from that direction. Um, as I've just been saying, and I think, uh, as I was, I believe there is some spots for you guys to write stuff down. I think this is one of them, and obviously feel free to pause the video and make sure that you have those down. But here we show just a very quick version of this substitution reaction taking place. The hydroxide coming in from the backside there, replacing the fluorine, and it, there's an exchange of functional groups that happen. Um, and so the thing that leaves the fluorine there is called the leaving group. So some things are what we call better leaving groups than others, meaning more likely to occur in a reaction. Uh, or just m more reactive, I guess, if they're a better leaving group. They're more easily, they more easily leave the atom, but uh, the molecule. But fluorine is, fluorine is the leaving group in this particular situation. Um, as I was saying earlier, we need to really think about three-dimensional structures here when it comes to all organic reactions, but it's going to be particularly important here. Um, it is possible, when you think about a larger, a little bit more complicated molecule, remember collision theory, molecules actually have to collide to react. It's possible that structures on a molecule could physically block collisions from happening, or at least hinder or sort of prevent a little bit uh, collisions from happening. So that's called steric hindrance, meaning something about the structure of a molecule is preventing collisions from happening. And um, as I said, that's known as steric hindrance. And so when we think about the partially positive carbon that's on a uh, halogen alkane, primary halogen alkanes are going to be the most accessible, secondary and medium, and tertiary are going to be pretty much, they're going to completely block attack by the nucleophile. And I'll explain that more in just a second, and we'll take a look at it. Uh, but here we have um, a horrible meme that I made. But here we have our, our uh, hydroxide nucleophile that wants to attack my partially positive carbon here. We've got our beefy tertiary halogen alkane, which is going to pretty much completely prevent this from happening. And then our wimpy primary, primary halogen alkane, our ROH, is just going to go right by the little doge over there. Um, okay, so another look at this. 
All right, so take a look at these three pictures. Across the top, we have just kind of a straightforward like Lua structure, but down on the bottom, we have more realistic what we call a space filling model. So keep in mind that these these functional groups, these methyl groups here, they take up space. They're real, you know, they're objects that exist in the world. And a sort of a more realistic view of them is the bottom one. So actually, let's start over here on the right. So we got a bond here between the carbon and the chlorine. Um, so the, this carbon here is partially positive. So this is the one that the nucleophile is going to attack, this specific portion of this molecule right here. And so the, the, the orange is the chlorine. So any sort of nucleophile can very easily make contact with this carbon right here. Now, um, as we go a little bit further, um, the, this carbon is less and less accessible. So this is the reactive carbon right here. And then uh, this is the reactive carbon right here. And then here it's not accessible at all. Basically, the amount of orange that you can see is kind of an indicator of how blocked that carbon is. So although it looks pretty open in this picture right here, the reality is that, remember, this carbon right here is the reactive one because that's the partially positive one attacked to the chlorine. These methyl groups more or less completely block that from being attacked by a nucleophile. So... As we're going to the right, the carbon is getting more and more accessible. Um, chemical reactions take place in more than one step. Remember that. We talked before about in kinetics that the, uh, the slowest step of reaction is what we call the rate determining step. We talked about that. Um, usually we talk about that in year one. And that's going to be the step with the highest activation energy. And only species that are involved in the rate determining t step influence the rate of a chemical reaction. This is all stuff that we talked about in kinetics. So if a particular reactant is not involved in the slow step, it's not going to affect the rate of the reaction at all. So the reaction will run at the same rate, like regardless of the concentration of that particular reaction, uh, reactant. So what we're going up to is things called SN1 and SN2 mechanisms. Um, SN1 and SN2 refer to different possible mechanisms, mechanisms for a substitution reaction. Uh, SN1 stands for substitution nucleophilic unimolecular. In this mechanism, the slow step only involves the decomposition of one molecule. So the, the one refers to unimolecular, and the, the one refers to the number of molecules in the slow step. SN2 means substitution nucleophilic bimolecular. So there's two molecules that are involved in the slow step of the reaction. And this is going to determine a lot of the chemistry about how, how a reaction is going to take place. And, you know, we're going to look at these one at a time and look at them in more detail. Um, and depending on the exact circumstances, a reaction is going to proceed in one of two ways. So let's look at uh, SN2 a little bit first. Um, SN2 reactions occur in primary halogen alkanes, those one where the partially positive carbon is very accessible. And they're going to occur in what is more or less one step. It kind of looks like two steps, but it kind of, it all pretty much happens simultaneously. Um, so once we initiate this step, everything else is going to happen more or less at the same instant. The nucleophile is going to attack the partially positive carbon from the side opposite the halogen. This is the high activation energy part. This is the slow part. You're going to get a transition state. And there's going to be this kind of five carbon with five bonds on it in this little intermediate. Now, about now, you're about like that cat here. Uh, I get it. This is weird. Um, so we're going to go through. We're going to look at this reaction. We're going to watch some videos and stuff like that and try to come to an understanding of how both SN2 and SN1 work. Um, so it's a one-step process. And the other parts are going to occur nearly instantaneously, as I said. There's going to be a carbon-halogen bond that's going to break via heterolytic fission, and a new carbon-nucleophile bond is going to form. It's known as a concerted mechanism because the bond breaking and bond forming occur simultaneously. This is unlike SN1, as we'll see. And the process is going to flip the stereochemistry, almost like an umbrella turning inside out. So let's watch this video here. So this video, um, moves through SN1 and SN2. Primary halogen and alkanes undergo SN2 reactions, where the S denotes a substitution reaction. 
The N shows the reaction involves a nuclear file. Two is the number of species involved in the... By the way, I have to stop here and say I, I, I always watch this and I can't... I imagine the production of this video and the uh, people working on it, you know, they present it to their boss. They're like, look at what we made. This is wonderful. And the boss is like, mm, not bad. But you know what this needs is some echo. You get some echo in this thing, it's next level. And uh, that's the only way I can imagine they just decided that this happened to work. But yeah, really, I don't know. I think it really uh, adds a little something. A little something, the echo here. Slowest rate determining steps. A nuclear file is an electron pair donor. It is attracted towards species carrying the full or partial positive charge with which it can form a dative covalent bond. Consider the reaction between a hydroxide ion in solution and bromoethane. Both reactants are involved in determining the rate of the reaction in a one-step process. British people say ethane instead of ethane. FYI. The hydroxide ion attacks the carbon atom from the opposite side to the halogen atom because the bromine atom A is so large it impedes the approach of the smaller hydroxide ion and B it repels the negative charge new Okay, so as you as you see this this bond is forming here and the bond is forming between the hydroxide and this partially positive carbon and at the same time the bond in the uh, to the bromine is breaking. So I want you to watch carefully as this thing proceeds. You're going to see these two little hydrogens here. And the whole thing, imagine sort of like an umbrella flipping inside out. As this bond happens, this whole thing kind of inverts. And the stereochemistry, if you think back to when we talked about, um, um, you know, chirality and all that, the stereochemistry inverts on the thing. So watch for that as this reaction happens. Clear file. The lone electron pair on the nuclear file forms a new dative covalent bond with the partially charged carbon atom to give an unstable transition state complex. The complex behaves like an umbrella blowing inside out as the bonds rearrange into a tetrahedral structure. A bromide ion, called the leaving group, is released. Showing it again. Again, note the flipping of the stereochemistry. Transition state right here. Highest activation energy point. Bond of bromine breaks. And so now, hopefully, that gives you some kind of visual of how this reaction is taking place. Um, and <laughs> yeah, I forgot to add another one of these in there. You might still be feeling this way, but let me, uh, we'll, we'll work on this and draw some mechanisms um, to see if we can figure this out. So this says, draw the curly arrow reaction mechanism to show the nucleophilic substitution involving hydroxide ions and bromoethane, or ethane, as that guy said. Uh, so this is the one we, we were just looking at, but let's show how we would show that mechanism on pencil and paper. I think for now, I'm not going to show the stereochemistry inversion just to um, keep it a bit more straightforward for the moment, and then we can add that later. So we got the hydroxide ion here. Okay, so uh, bromoethane or ethane. Okay, so um, the carbon is partially positive, the bromide ion is partially negative. So first step of the reaction, or only step of the reaction really, is that this hydroxide is going to come in here and attack this carbon. And as I've told you before, we need to be very careful about where we draw these arrows. The, the end of the arrow starts where the electrons start, and we point exactly towards where they're going, which is on that carbon. And then um, what we have here is we're going to draw a transition state next. Um, I should say before we draw the transition state, we're going to whoops, we're going to um, show that bond breaking there at the same time, and then we're going to show this transition state.
Okay, so a couple of things to note about this. Some things that will, you will lose points if you don't show it. Um, the, I keep fast forwarding there, I don't mean to. This whole thing has a negative one charge, so we're gonna have the whole thing in brackets with a negative one. I'm showing a dotted line, which is showing the bond breaking, uh, forming rather with the OH and the bond with the BR breaking. Um, and both those things are important. The, the hydroxide is coming in from the opposite side of the bromine. That's another thing that's important because it does. So those are the key factors we want to show in this transition state. And as I said, we might, in certain, depending on how the question is asked, we might want to show the stereochemistry inverting. I'm not showing it this time just to keep it a little bit more basic. So what are we going to have after that? Well, we're going to have a carbon. We're going to convert this thing into an alcohol. And then we also don't want to forget to show this bromine, this bromide ion that's going to be left over. So um, that is the that is the basic uh, idea of how to draw this mechanism, and this is the SN2 mechanism. So definitely something worth practicing that we're going to look at a little bit more. Um, and then this is just another kind of more professionally done drawing of it, where we have again the new. So and then they're trying to show the stereochemistry inverting here. Um, these little hydrogens are going to flip across the other side like a little umbrella. But I just wanted to show you drawing the mechanism from scratch. Okay, so uh, that's the SN2 mechanism. Now we're going to look at the SN1 mechanism. Um, tertiary halogen alkanes are going to react exclusively by SN1. They can't do the SN2. It takes place in two distinct steps. The spontaneous heterolytic fission of the carbon-halogen bond. This is the slow step. And then uh, you're going to get a tertiary carbocation. And in step two, um, the nucleophile is going to attack the carbocation. That can attack from either direction. It's going to be very quick. Going to get a dative covalent bond. Um, and it's going to produce a mixture of both possible optical isomers, unlike the other SN1, which only produces one. So let's take a look at another wonderful video by the same people for the SN1 reaction. Okay. Undergo SN1 reactions. Same S echo. Indicates a substitution reaction is occurring. It's not broke, don't N fix it. Indicates that a nucleophile is involved. And one indicates that only one species is involved in the slowest rate determining step. In tertiary halogenoalkanes, the small hydrogen atoms in primary halogenoalkanes are replaced by bulkier alkyl groups. The bulky alkyl groups do not allow attacking species to approach the central carbon atom. Yeah, I think they're going to show it a little bit more space filling. This this carbon looks accessible, but it's actually not. It's totally blocked by these methyl groups. So the SN2 reaction can't happen because, remember, the, the thing that initiates the SN2 reaction is a, the hydroxide coming in and forming a bond with this carbon, but it can't because it's blocked. So that's why this can't do SN2. Consider the reaction between two methyl, two bromopropane, and a hydroxide Like that, ion. methyl. It has a two-step enthalpy profile. The first step, the heterolytic fission of the carbon-bromine bond, has a high activation energy, EA1, and therefore determines the rate of the reaction. The first and that bond is just completely breaking on its own, which does happen from time to time. That involves only the halogenoalkane and proceeds via a transition state complex to form a carbocation. So important to note how the structure changed. It becomes a trigonal planar type molecule, and that happening opens up this carbon to attack. The second step has a much lower activation energy, EA2, and hence is considerably faster than the first step. The carbocation reacts with a nucleophilic hydroxide ion via a second transition state to form the product 2 methyl propen 2 ol So here we see it again. Bromine leaves. Transition state switch to the 
trigonal planar carbocation, which opens up the carbon for attack from either direction. So if you can imagine this hydroxide could come in from the front, this side that it's showing there, or from the back, which would result in two different, uh, two different stereochemistries. I mean, in this case, it's not going to matter, but. So what about a secondary halogen alkane? Well, they're going to proceed or can proceed by either an SN1 or an SN2 mechanism. So it says, let's draw the reaction mechanism for the reaction of 2-bromo-2-methylpropane with hydroxide ions. Okay. Highlights the importance of knowing the naming system, or we're going to have a bit of a hard time with this. So 2-bromo-2-methylpropane. So propane means three carbons. Let me go back. One two, three, and uh, two methyl, CH3, and then the BR is here, and then we're going to have a CH3 here. Um, okay, so uh, this is a tertiary halogen alkane. This carbon is attached to three other carbons, and this bond is a fairly weak one, and it can spontaneously break. And that's how this reaction is going to start. That's the slow step of this reaction. And so from there, we're going to have this transition state where we have a carbocation. And, um, whoops, CH3, CH3, CH3. So positive charge on this right here. And then from there my nucleophile, in this case hydroxide, is going to attack that carbocation. And so we're going to convert this into an alcohol, like so, tertiary alcohol. So this is the slow step right here. And then this is the much faster step right here. Um, and so that's our SN1 mechanism for the tertiary halogen alkane. And then again, this is a more professionally drawn one, but the same thing that you see here. Uh, we got the bromine bond leaving, attacked by the hydroxide onto the carbocation, and then we get the new product. So that's it for this one, folks. We're going to, uh, before we go any further, um, that's going to be a subject for another video. But thanks for watching. Have a good rest of your day. And we'll see you soon.